Hey everyone, what's your comfort game? You know, the game you throw on to unwind after a long day, the game you play when you want to turn your brain off for a bit and just relax, the game you keep coming back to even after all these years. I've got a couple, but one you might not expect is Stubbs the Zombie, Rebel Without a Pulse. Released in 2005 by Wideload and remastered in 2021 by original publisher Aspire, it's a game that puts you in the decayed shoes of the titular Stubbs and lets you loose to bring the retro-futuristic city of Punchbowl to its knees. I loved this game as a kid, and it was a great joy to come back to it with the recent remaster. But like the zombies at the heart of the title, there's still something a little bit rotten at its core. Fun as it can be, some things are better left dead and buried, so let's talk about it. But before I get my hands into the guts of this game, exactly one of you might be thinking, hang on, haven't I reviewed this already? Yes, Stubbs the Zombie was the first game I ever did a video on long before I started making critiques as Monotonal Lizard, or even the book reviews on my other channel. It's actually where the phrase getting my hands into the guts of this game comes from. There's even a reference to it in the Jurassic Park video. The original version of the review has since been unlisted because the production was, to put it mildly, garbage. I was still finding my feet as a critic, and no one watched it back then anyway, but I've always wanted to exhume the corpse for another go around, if only to have that comment in the Jurassic Park video make sense. So when better than Halloween to dig it up from its unmarked grave and take another look at the horrors lurking within. Just a heads up, there are going to be spoilers, so consider this your only warning. Also, occasionally there are going to be flashing lights. Whenever they're about to start, I'll put up this big red exclamation mark in the top right corner and a timestamp to skip to so you can avoid them. Also also, if you enjoy the video and want to help the channel grow, please like and subscribe if you haven't already, share it around, and let me know what you think in the comments. And if you really enjoyed, you can join the handful of people generously supporting me on Patreon and Ko-Fi. Links are in the description. Let's get to it. Oh come on, I can tell by the look on your face, you're gonna love Punchbowl! Follow me, we've got so much to see! The original version of this video was made with the original physical PC release of Stubbs the Zombie, and needless to say, it was an ordeal to get running. Ever since the hardware the game was built for passed into obsolescence, Stubbs the Zombie has been a nightmare to get working, which I think is one of the reasons so few people talked about it until the 2021 remaster. My original reason for wanting to make this video at all was to bring Stubbs back from the dead, but it seems with the re-release, Stubbs is damn well capable of doing that himself with no help from me. In fact, for a moment there it felt like he was actively refusing it. While working on the original version of this review, the game simply refused to run. I spent an entire day installing, uninstalling, and reinstalling not only the game, but Microsoft Visual C++ versions, Microsoft.net versions, downloading missing DLL files, and battling that bastard of an error message 0CX00007B. Ultimately the fix turned out to be pathetically simple. Just rename the executable file from stubs to codsp.exe. Why doing this worked? I have no idea. But once I got past the obstacle of getting the game to launch, it ran perfectly. So if you've still got an original physical copy of the game rattling around, that should get it working on modern hardware. If you're running the 2021 remaster though, you shouldn't have a problem. All the kinks have been ironed out. The game now runs smooth as butter it crashed well. Okay, it seems like there are still a couple gremlins creeping around in the code, but this time there's a much easier fix. If you're on Steam, just switch the overlay off and turn off all the visual effects like the green filter and film grain. The game ran fine after that, or at least it did for me. I'd suggest it anyway because holy hell, I never noticed how good this game looked back in the day. Stubbs the Zombie is a charming game. It has a style and tone that is apparent from the second you reach the main menu, and can continues right through to the end credits. But I never realised how bright and colourful it could be behind that fuck ugly green filter. 
I get the idea behind it was to portray the world through Stubbs' eyes. The remaster didn't call it Zombovision for nothing, but far out, it's hard to look at. Maybe it's just because I'm used to the crisp, clean graphics of more modern video games, or even just less intrusive visual effects, but I don't know how I ever played Stubbs the Zombie with this screen vomit enabled. It looks so much better without it. What's interesting is that the green filter only appears during gameplay. It vanishes the second you enter a cutscene, and boy the difference is stark. I'm glad you can shut it off, and not just because it keeps causing the current version to crash. I want to see more of the game, more of this world, without having so much green shit smeared across the screen. The film grain is already intrusive enough. Also, it looks like they removed the grayscale effect after you possess some enemies with the hand, which I'm not going to complain about. It made shooting anything next to impossible, though it's odd that the remaster devs didn't remove it for all of the enemies. This is after I turned off all the post-processing effects and filters, so I don't know what's going on here. The campy 50s B-movie aesthetic is nothing new to video games. Fallout and the first two Bioshock titles used it to great effect in the creation of their own settings, and it deserves to be seen in unobstructed detail here, because while those games generally went for a more serious tone, Stubbs the Zombie's main goal is very obviously to have fun, much more Dawn of the Dead than World War Z. That philosophy extends to every facet of the game's design and presentation. Wide Load could have very easily played the horror elements inherent in the premise straight, but instead they chose to build the title's foundations in comedy, and I'm so glad they did. Everything about Stubbs the Zombie is absurd and over the top. The B-movie aesthetic was already present in the 1959 setting, but having the game take place in a city built on 1950s ideals of what the future might look like removed moves the game completely from any sense of reality. The inhabitants of Punchbowl are caricatures, absolute buffoons who munch as much scenery as the zombies do brains, and that is impressive on the part of the zombies given so few of the living seem to have any. The opening cinematic makes it clear that everyone in Punchbowl from the city's founders to its lowliest criminals are scum too. Bigoted assholes devoid of any sympathetic traits, and that makes the violence you bring down upon them all the easier to enjoy. Here in Punchbowl, for the first time in human history, life is what it was meant to be, free of all unpleasantness. Why, someday the entire world will be like Punchbowl, but for now, it stands alone, a beacon of purity and human potential in a world of social upheaval and moral turpitude. Bold words from a bold man. Stubbs himself, while a monstrous force of chaos in a literal sense, is just along for the ride, and the zombie hordes he raises tend more toward goofball than terrifying. <laughs> Done. There's a lot of attention to detail in the world building that the game never really draws attention to either. For example, there are so many ramps and so few stairs in Punchbowl to accommodate the robots who run on treads. The little detail of the hovercars having normal wheels for landing pads is a nice touch too. The only aspect of the game's presentation that feels out of step with this design philosophy is the extreme levels of violence and gore that Stubbs the Zombie revels in. That is, until you can consider the violence in conjunction with all the other elements on display, and it becomes clear that the game is such an obvious over-the-top fantasy no one could possibly take it seriously. And yet back in 2005, some folks actually did. It seems quaint now, but Stubbs the Zombie, along with the original Fear, caused a small but noteworthy moral panic about cannibalism in video games in the United States. One US Senator, Joe Lieberman, even went so far as to claim, quote, it's it's just the worst kind of message to kids. They can be dangerous to your children's health." End quote. Wideload rebuked the accusation not by saying that the game was intended for adults, which it is, but by saying, quote, "...the current kerfuffle in the US media about Stubbs the Zombie can be summed up in one word, semantics. Stubbs, they say, is a cannibal. This is nonsense, as anyone with a working knowledge of cannibals can tell you. Stubbs fails all the classic litmus tests for cannibalism. He does not wear a bone through his nose, he does not help FBI agents track down serial killers, he has not written a cookbook, he is not named Jeffrey Dahmer, the list goes on and on. 
Stubbs is a zombie. Thus the title, Stubbs the Zombie. Zombies eat brains. That's what they do. Stubbs cannot just saunter into the cafeteria and order a plate of freedom fries. He has to fight for his meals. In fact, actual cannibals only make it harder for Stubbs to eat, which is why this cannibalism story is insulting as well as injurious. It's no surprise that the all-human media cartel resorts to distortions and name-calling. Their anti-zombie bias has been evident for decades, and Stubbs is just the newest target. If you're a thinking adult, you're probably ready to hear the other side of the story. You'll find it in Stubbs the Zombie in Rebel Without a Pulse, in stores now for Xbox, PC, and Macintosh. Don't let the humanity-centric media tell you what to think about zombies. A free mind is a tasty mind." End quote. No such excuse for Paxton Fettel, though. The gently mocking tone of Wideload's response is very much in the style of comedy writing present throughout the game, poor taste and all. When Stubbs the Zombie isn't skewing hard into absurdist humour, or just being outright crass, it's poking fun at everything in sight in every way it can, from visual gags to story beats to cut scenes to NPC dialogue. Welcome to the Punch Bowl Dam, where our motto is, damn it. To just the general chaos of the gameplay, even to the game's manual. Man, remember when games had manuals? Which had lines like, quote, for a man buried in soft peat for almost 30 years, Stops has remarkable muscle tone, end quote. And damn, it's not wrong. But just because Stubbs the zombie is constantly making jokes doesn't mean all of them land. The game has a very mid-2000s sense of humour that mostly went over my head as a kid, but these days just makes me roll my eyes. Things like the greenhouse's sodomobiles and Nobchi's farm are the sort of groan-worthy garbage that Stubbs' comedy wallows in. At one point you can rescue a sheep from a horny farmer, and it'll even thank you for it. From this day forward, zombies and sheep will be friends. This is something I only discovered while playing the remastered version. I have no memory of ever finding this in the original physical release, but it wouldn't surprise me if it had always been there. It's the exact sort of joke I'd expect from Wide Load. Another gag I didn't pick up until this most recent playthrough is the fact the barbershop quartet guarding Maggie Monday throughout the game are introduced singing about Maggie's melons. <laughs> You're a nice man, Mr. Skegness, but don't you have better things to do than make passes at your employer's mother? Not that you even have to keep an ear out for the crass jokes, because the cutscene's dialogue puts them front and center. Seemly happens on this, uh, wonderful, uh, sunny, fabulous, sunny, huge, eyes up here, day. It's not like Stubbs the Zombie was the only game of this era to revel in crude humor based in sex and bodily fluids. It was just the style at the time, and sometimes it does work for me, like how weirded out these cops are by Pumpbot's, um, enthusiasm for his job. I'm not sure I have enough cash to cover. Oh, never you mind, sir. It's on the house. Oh, there's no need for that. Oh, it's my pleasure, officers. My pleasure. Hey! Want me to look under the hood? No! But on the whole, they fall flat. Mostly just by virtue of being drawn out long past the point of being funny. The pump bot bit only works as well as it does because it's relegated to a single cutscene. In contrast, the 10 minute section where you piss into Punchbowl's reservoir more than outstays its welcome. Thankfully crude humour is only about a third of the jokes. Most of it revels in the absurdity of the situation, or makes little references to famous zombie fiction or genre tropes, or just gets a little macabre. Our roving reporter Jimmy Nesbitt is on the scene now and reporting live by telephone. Jimmy. Oh God, help me! I don't want to die! The NPC dialogue is great, both in terms of writing and delivery. Don't eat me! No, 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 no! My son got me with a grenade. No! How will I juggle? Oh! But I especially love the robots who almost know something's wrong, but never quite work it out enough to join in Punchbowl's defense until it's too late for them to actually do anything. You ought to drink some milk. It'll keep your bones from collapsing. According to my data tapes, only zombies do that. 
or take the posters posted around Punchbowl's police department. They're worth a bit of a chuckle. It might all still be in your face, but at least it's a bit wittier than a big old piss. The wit of the writing extends to the manual too. Indeed, the manual actually provides a lot of context to the game not present beyond its pages, such as why you end up fighting an army of barbershop quartet singers. Weirdly, it also spoils quite a lot. Just about every enemy, ability, and vehicle type is described in detail, and even the reason why Stubbs came back from the dead is there if you look hard enough. But the comedy is such that it's still worth a read. Hit or miss as the jokes can be, they at least help to set a tone of complete absurdity. You are not meant to take anything that happens in this game seriously, and thus are free to enjoy your part in the zombie apocalypse. The comedy permeates every aspect of the game, for better or worse. And it all starts right here, on a lawn near Punchbowl City Hall, in the middle of a picnic, the day of the city's opening. The game begins on a brief cutscene that introduces the player to both the city of Punchbowl and its main players. There's Andrew Munday, its founder, Maggie Munday, his mother, and Dr. Herman Y, the ex-Nazi scientist who made all the wondrous technology possible. But don't worry about his past, he's one of the good guys now. Why? There is no mention of Stubbs at all, and no indication that he's even coming, until suddenly he's here, grasping at a hot dog through grass as green as his putrescent skin. The hows and whys of Stubbs' death and resurrection are, right now, unimportant. The teen Stubbs interrupted are less shocked at the fact that there's a dead man standing next to them than they are annoyed that he not only ruined their picnic, but stole their food. Just about everyone he meets cares more that he might be a communist than a corpse. The commies have infiltrated this country so completely that even the dead have turned against us! Likewise, the guidebot who arrives to give the tutorial knows something's off about Stubbs given the gaping wound in his side, but how could they possibly go to the hospital now when they've only just started the tour? What I love about this opening is that it makes clear to the player instantly that this is not a game about asking serious questions. This is a game about eating brains, and you will be eating a lot of them. 545 was the final count by the time the credits rolled for me, at least in the playthrough I did for the original version of this video. And that's not including cutscenes or grey matter munched by other zombies. You do get other abilities as the game progresses, but eating brains is not only your primary way of dealing with enemies, it's also the only way to recharge your special attacks, and a faster way to regain health than just waiting for the bar to refill. You would think the repetitive nature of the act would make it boring busy work after the first dozen or so, but it never outstays its welcome. Like the glory kills in the new Doom games, brain munching in Stubbs the Zombie is short and sweet. There are a variety of contextual animations that play depending on how you approach any given enemy, as well as a variety of incredulous screams that make each slurped hypothalamus just different enough to keep the whole mechanic from becoming stale. Couple that with the bits of brain that go flying with every skull you crunch, and it all comes together into a scene that is so evocative of the act that most of the time you'll never even notice Stubbs's model doesn't actually open his mouth to perform it. The little hole that appears in the heads of the NPCs you eat is the cherry on top of the bloody sundae too. Speaking of the character models though, they really haven't aged all that well. Especially their painted on faces and weird theme park animatronic mouths, even after getting a little graphical touch up in the remaster. But there is a retro charm to them that I can't help but like. Stubbs is the one real exception in my opinion. He still looks great. He clearly had a lot more effort put into him than the other characters, right up to and including actual eyeballs. But the quality of the models only really becomes apparent when seen up close in cutscenes. In gameplay, when coupled with the motion captured animations, they actually manage to come alive, or dead, as the case may be. There are a lot of them too, character models and animations both. Every type of enemy has at least a couple of variations, and each one of those variants has a zombified counterpart too. But the way the undead shuffle along is in such stark contrast to the more lively animations of the, well, living, that it's rare you'll ever mistake one for the other. The amount of characters, both living and dead, running around any given area of a level might not hold a candle to more recent titles like Days Gone, or even older games like the original Dead Rising, but there are usually enough, with enough variety between them,
them that it gives the illusion of being a much larger crowd than it actually is. It's for that reason I can't bring myself to dislike the character models. They go such a long way in keeping the game from becoming a slog, though I do think it's a missed opportunity that the remastered version didn't up the character count for the big crowd scenes. Don't get me wrong, when the game does let you build up a sizeable horde, it can end up frustrating to get around them when you're in the middle of the scrum, and it would probably play havoc with mechanical balancing, but it's such a shame that the remaster didn't take advantage of modern day hardware to turn your shuffling crowd into an onrushing tide. When I think back to the game that I played as a kid, I remember huge waves of zombies crashing over the handful of survivors trying to defend Punchbowl. But playing it again now, it's only ever a dozen at most, and usually less. Given I played the original physical release in the original version of this video, I gave it a pass, and it would probably end up breaking the difficulty curve overall, but if you're going to update the game to run on modern systems, you might as well make the most of it. I understand the point of a remaster is to make the game playable and easily accessible again to modern audiences, but it's one of those things I think would have helped maintain the vision of the original without straying into outright remake territory. Anyway, now that that rant's out of the way, the rest of the tutorial is pretty awful. It was bad back in 2005, it's still bad now. Even the achievement you get for completing it is called, that didn't age well. Aside from a couple of fun jokes, it's just a boring slog through each of the game's basic mechanics, and I wish the remaster had introduced some way to skip it, maybe by attacking Guidebot to make her move on. Thankfully things improve soon after once you reach the plaza by Punchbowl City Hall, and you're set free to eat your way through the nearby populace. Stubbs the Zombie is always at its best when it lets you run wild through an area with reckless abandon, and the plaza is a fantastic first impression. For such a huge space, it can actually be pretty empty if you take the time to explore, but it does create a good sense of scale for Punchbowl. I love the detail of the rowboat out the back of City Hall, too. Anyway, once you've had your fill, Stubbs makes his way onto the nearby monorail and sets off for the first real level of the game, the greenhouse. It's there that Maggie Monday and her barbershop quartet of bodyguards are waiting to cut the ribbon on Punchbowl's self-sufficient food supply, and Stubbs, it seems, is a zombie with a crush. Unfortunately, the greenhouse is a poor follow-up after the plaza hits the ground running. Every level of Stubbs the Zombie is themed around some sort of narrative or mechanical concept. For the greenhouse, that concept is a massive maze-like area, best traversed by the flying sodomobiles. Ugh you have access to from the beginning of the level. Are the Sodomobiles fun to use? Yes. Are they right for Stubbs the Zombie? Absolutely fucking not. Stubbs the Zombie is at its best when you're on foot, at the head of a shuffling wave of undead, and kills made with the Sodomobile, or any vehicle for that matter, do not result in more zombies. They just create corpses. This is something the game is actually pretty good about. Enemies killed with gunfire or explosions will generally not reanimate either, and while I appreciate the verisimilitude of having those rules hard-coded into the game, it does make the greenhouse a bit of a bore. It also doesn't help that you're given no real direction. Everything in the greenhouse looks more or less the same, with the only indication that you're going the right way being the appearance of more enemy-driven vehicles. By now those of you who have played the original Halo might be thinking, hang on, the Sodomobile is a lot like the Wraith, and that's because it basically is. I've never seen a game's marketing lean so heavily on its use of a third-party engine built for a much more successful title as a selling point. It'd be like if Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines tried to sell itself by saying made with the Half-Life 2 engine, but that's exactly what Stubbs the Zombie did. It's right there on the box. That it was becomes readily apparent as soon as you step behind the wheel of the vehicles, but it's also obvious in a lot of the environments, nowhere more so than in the greenhouse. This hallway particularly looks like it wandered in from Silent Cartographer and never found its way back. Most of the environments have not not aged well. In fact, they look as rotten as Stubbs himself, and I'd go so far as to say they can be immersion-breaking levels of distracting, especially the interiors. Most of the time it works just enough to not ruin the experience, but there are some areas of the game that look real bad, and looked real bad at release. 
It's not helped by the lighting, which is a mixed bag. Stubbs the Zombie can be a surprisingly dark game. I cranked up the gamma for parts of the recording while making the original version of this video, and still found it kind of hard to see. I didn't have as much of a problem with the remaster, but that may be because Aspire cranked it up themselves before I even hit a new game. There are times when the lighting adds to the experience, and others when it all just looks flat. Stubbs' cigarette consistently popped, but whenever I noticed it, it mostly made me wish the rest of the lighting was just as good. Thankfully the particle effects are a lot better. The physics in this game are a joy to behold. They're not straight up ragdolls, but the way heads and arms and bodies go flying around the levels when things pop off really add to the sense of chaos, especially when they leave behind so many blood splatters. Not just blood splatters either. We've got brains, we've got green zombie blood, we've got piss, fuck have we got so much piss. We've got puke? I didn't even know enemies could puke. I only caught that in the edit. What the hell? No amount of blood splatters can save the terror skyboxes though, which is surprising given how beautiful the original Halo could be in regard to its Starscape vistas. Shout out especially to these hills you can see from the dam that look like they've got broken textures. Things do pick up as you move out of the maze and into the second half of the level where you're forced to go on foot and can amass a small horde. You're also given your first upgrade, a gut grenade, which is exactly what it says. You catch up to Maggie and her bodyguards in a cutscene, but then it ends and they're just gone. Okay. All in all, the greenhouse is not a bad idea for a level, but to put it so early in the game when it showcases the absolute worst of the gameplay was a real misstep. Thankfully, the next level is a lot better. Exiting through the greenhouse gift shop, you make your way to the police station, where Stubbs manages to accidentally find his way into the lineup room. There is something quietly hilarious about there being this many prisoners in the city's lockup on its first day open to the public, but just as well for Stubbs, I guess. The police station is where the game really hits its stride in my opinion. You're able to build up a sizable army as you travel through the building at a level that is largely linear, but still has enough deviations and little side rooms to make it feel more than just one long corridor. This massive battle in the briefing room stands out in my mind as one of the game's best, as waves of cops come rushing in to battle the waves of zombies, and quite literally paint the walls red, or green, or both. It's Christmas! It's here that I'd like to talk about the zombie AI. It would have been easy for the developers to make Stubbs the Zombie into a third person action slash RTS style game, like Overlord, by giving the player any sort of control over the undead, but they didn't. The game may be mechanically simplistic, but I do not mean that in any way as a bad thing. By restricting player control to Stubbs, the focus remains tightly fixed on the aspects of the gameplay that are the most fun, eating brains, raising the dead, and causing chaos. The only two ways you're given to interact with the zombie hordes are a whistle to call them closer, and a shove to get them out of the way. Not that you'll ever really need to. The zombie AI goes out of its way to stay out of yours, to the point where you don't really have to think about them beyond enjoying the carnage they cause unless you're in a cramped space. There's no micromanaging busy work. Zombies will attack, distract, and even munch the brains of nearby enemies. Left to their own devices, they will develop devour their way through a group of cops or civilians like you'd expect a real life zombie horde would, and better yet, they'll never do it the same way twice. The emergent gameplay created by the zombie and enemy AI means that levels may not change between playthroughs, but every journey through them will be entirely unique. For such a short game, it really bumps up the replay value, and it's a big reason why I loved it so much as a kid, why I keep coming back to it to unwind. But the chaos is not to lie. Last. Stubbs is finally overpowered and taken away for examination in the station lockup. While the scientists are bickering about where they left the bone saw, Stubbs detaches his arm and tosses it aside to set him free. If you played Aliens vs Predator 2 back in the day, controlling the hand is much the same as controlling the facehugger in the first level of the Alien campaign, right down to the wall crawling and a strange colour filter. The purpose of the hand in gameplay is to possess people, but its purpose here is to facilitate a short stealth section that provides a nice break between the chaos of the surrounding levels. Not that stealth is actually required. You can possess a detective and gun down everyone in sight if you'd prefer, or you can make like Agent 47 and Silent Assassin your way back to Stubbs. I need to use the restroom. 
people will notice if you act out, not just by going around killing everyone you see, but by awkwardly halo jumping around the level, which I thought was a nice touch. If you behave yourself, one or two of the enemies might draw their weapons and take a closer look, but if you keep your cool, they won't start blasting. Outside of this short section though, I never found a point in the game where using the hand for purposes of stealth was better than just shuffling in to eat some brains. But it's nice that it's an option besides running in guns blazing. Which brings me to the gunplay. It's ironic that a game built with the same engine as the original Halo has such terrible combat mechanics. Combat evolved? No. This is combat devolved. Just end it. Holy shit! What's funny is that I can't even tell if this was intentional to incentivize melee combat, or if the developers just did a bad job of it. You can, potentially, possess every enemy type in the game, which, potentially, gives you access to every weapon in the game. The amount of variety is impressive from a technical standpoint, but mechanically the shooting is slow and inaccurate and not really worth the effort unless you want to have a go at some of the more out there weapons, like this nuclear rocket launcher some late game enemy carry. The enemies you possess come with infinite ammo, but they have no way to heal. And as I mentioned before, kills made with firearms don't result in more zombies. One last thing to mention about the hand is that your attempted possessions can be denied if enemies are wearing headgear, and it's cool that Wide Load accounted for that. After making your way through the rest of the police station, you come face to face with Chief Masters. Chief Masters? Chief Masters, Master Chief, I only just got that far out. Anyway, it looks like it's setting you up for a fight, but then Masters jumps up onto his desk and declares, I told you I would dance in your grave, and I meant it. Thus begins the game's most absurd point, a DDR-style dance-off with the police chief set to remastered pop hits from the 1950s. The little anachronistic reference to Thriller from Stubbs right before the fight starts is just the icing on the cake. It's such an insane moment, but the spectacle of it makes it work. It's not a throwaway gag either. You go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the chief for five rounds, each set to a different song that I dare not play here on YouTube for fear of getting obliterated by by the copyright drones. And though it's definitely a beginner's idea of a rhythm game, it's not without some small amount of challenge. I was able to sleepwalk my way through it except for the double beats, which are either broken or require such specific timing that I was never able to crack them. It is also the best boss fight in the game by a wide, wide margin, which makes it as good a time as any to talk about the game's music and sound design. The music, both the original songs and the remastered 1950s bangers, are all pretty good. If I have any criticisms of the music, it's that it is grossly underutilized. This boss fight is the only real moment you'll hear the licensed songs in the 2021 remaster. The 2005 original didn't feature them much more either. They were present in the main menu, and a diner you visit in the late game, but that was it. The original music might be even rarer. The only times I really noticed it were whenever I used the hand and during cutscenes. There are a couple of original songs too, sung by the Barbershop Quartet, but beyond the one that plays over the end credits, they're easy to miss in the backgrounds of cutscenes or beneath the roar of a Pershing tank. Otherwise, the music is almost non-existent. I never noticed throughout most of the game that it was the sounds of the zombies, enemies, and chaotic fighting between the two that actually made up most of the soundscape, with no ambient music whatsoever. If I ever found myself with a moment to breathe between fights without a horde at my back, the game could get noticeably quiet.
but I think it's a testament to the sound design that I barely ever noticed the lack of ambient music playing beneath the gameplay. It's just so juicy. Whether it's brain eating, or the pew pew of ray guns, or the ticking hiss of a primed gut grenade, or the rattle and whir of machinery, the sounds are appropriately visceral. But the real star of the show, like I've already mentioned, is the NPC dialogue. <laughs> You'll hear these lines hundreds of times before the end of the game, but there's enough variety between each of the enemies that they'll never get repetitive, except maybe for this zombie moan. The zombies do have the best death scream though, so it balances out. I will never not chuckle at that noise. If I do have one criticism of the sound design, it's that it sometimes feels like there's an invisible object emitting noise that doesn't quite travel like it should. Other times, like at the fountain in the plaza, the sound will get a little wonky depending on which way the camera is facing. It doesn't happen often, and it's not a big deal, but like with the music, it's noticeable when it does, and I'm not sure why the remaster didn't fix it. Beat that, zombie! With Masters having danced himself into the grave and blown the police station to smithereens in the process, Stubbs then ends up interrupting a young couple again as he falls out of the sky and onto the hood of their car. Better yet, it is the same girl from the opening moments of the game. I watched him die. Yeah, like three hours ago. Don't live in the past, Judy. It's time to move on. Hmm. Oh, Fred! 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 Oh. This seems like it would make for a great running gag that adheres to the rule of three, that you'd meet up with the poor girl again at some later point in the game. But no, this is the last time you see her. Assuming you don't end up eating her brains at the punch bowl mall. Or maybe she was a victim of friendly fire. Nice shot, idiot. Anyway, rolling right off the edge of the parking lot dumps Stubbs right at the head of the zombie horde that has been steadily growing since his rampage through the plaza outside City Hall. And it is there you will remain for the next two levels as you pass through downtown Punchbowl like an undead tsunami. These are, in my opinion, the best levels in the game. Not only because they play to the title's mechanical strengths, but because they depict something that is so rare in zombie media. The point at which the living are overrun, and the the tide turns irrevocably in favour of the dead. It's not uncommon to see the circumstances of the initial panic of the outbreak, such as in The Last of Us or George Romero's Dawn of the Dead, and the quiet ruin of the apocalyptic aftermath is almost ubiquitous in all modern zombie media. But the carnage in between is rarely described because of how expensive it usually is to depict. A few examples that spring to mind are the Battle of Yonkers from Max Brooks's World War Z, or the opening scenario of Resident Evil Outbreak, or even the opening levels of Resident Evil 6. Hell, even the start of Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead. But all those stories show the madness of the zombie apocalypse from the perspective of humanity. Your rampage through downtown Punchbowl is definitely not, and it is ridiculously fun. There is no denying what's happening now as in earlier levels. The people of Punchbowl understand what they're up against. Some have formed up mobs in order to fight it, while others have fled to the mall at Andrew Monday's insistence. But they're all just as helpless as the armed police officers to do anything meaningful about the zombies but run. 
It's also here that you'll fill out your roster of abilities with the sputum head. Aside from a handful of contextual doors to break, you will be given no further upgrades for the rest of the game. And now that you have them all, I think it's a good time to talk about them. I've already examined the hand in detail, but given it's the most complex of your abilities, I felt it deserved its own brief section. The rest of your special attacks are all offensive, all except the mega fart you get at the very start of the game. The humor surrounding its design is crude, sure but it is effective as a close range stun if you are getting overwhelmed. Its only drawback is that it takes a lot of brains to recharge and it doesn't cover that much area. The gut grenade is your main long range weapon and a good crowd clearer. Like the sticky grenade from Halo, it will attach to enemies which will send them running around in a panic and it can be remotely detonated with a second click of the button. I never did this myself but you can also lob them against a zombie and then give them a shove towards some enemies enemies to create a moving bomb. The game knows how valuable they are as your only real answer to distant enemies, and the low recharge requirement, as well as the fact you can hold up to three of them at a time, reflects this. The hand we've already discussed, but you have another arm based weapon at your disposal too. You can rip the arms off stunned enemies and use the severed limbs to beat people to death. In fact if an enemy wears any kind of helmet, this option outright replaces the possibility of brain munching. The arms are one hit kills on just about every enemy but only last free swings. Unless you take them from these big lads which have way more hits in them. NPCs and enemies even have unique dialogue if you go after them with a severed arm. <laughs> The last ability you get is the sputum head, where Stubbs rips off his own noggin, hat and all, and sends it rolling like a bowling ball through nearby enemies. The explosion it ends with deals more damage than the gut grenade, and it emits a damaging area of effect as it goes. Overall, it sounds great, but I found myself using it the least out of all the abilities, mostly due to the insane recharge requirement. Like all the mechanics in the game, these extra abilities are simplistic, but once again, that's not a bad thing. My only real criticisms of the special abilities is that the game, at least on normal, is so little of a challenge that aside from the gut grenade you won't actually need any of them until the last third. On easy you don't really need them at all. In the original physical release I had trouble getting the extra abilities to trigger, and in the original version of this video I went on a bit of a rant about it, but thankfully the problem seems to have been fixed in the 2021 remaster. I never encountered it during this playthrough. Either way, you don't really need the extra abilities against civilians and cops. The Quaker State Irregulars, a militia of stereotypical doomsday prepper anti-government hillbillies led by Andrew Monday's grandfather Otis, put up a little bit more of a fight in and around the Punchbowl shopping mall. These guys serve as the first real difficulty spike of the game. Their muskets and shotguns might have a slow rate of fire, but when they're in a group they can turn stubs to Swiss cheese in a matter of moments if you're not careful. Fight them alone and you're basically fucked, though they're a little more manageable with the help of a zombie be hoard, at least until Otis sets this big boy with a chainsaw on stubs. The chainsaw wielding man acts as the boss for this section of the game, and after a couple of hours with no real challenge, this guy kicked my ass. I actually had to start playing strategically to take him down. It was a surprising wake up call. I struggled with him in the original version of this video and thought things would be different in the remaster this time around, but nope, he still carved me up like a prized turkey over and over and over again, before I got just enough lucky shots to take him down. This guy can tank gut grenades like they're nothing, is immune to your big old fart of a stun, and can cut through your horde like they're not even there. I had to resort to kiting him around the boss arena taking pot shots where I could, because he was capable of killing me so quickly. Still, a janky boss at the level's end did little to sour my opinion on the shopping mall. To have such a building in the 1950s is a little anachronistic, but Punchbowl is a city of the future, and it's such an iconic setting for zombie media that it couldn't not be included 
included somewhere. Though nowhere near as big as a real shopping mall, I imagine you could fit the entire building inside just a single section of Dead Rising 1's map. It's still fun to go through such a well-known trope of zombie fiction from the other side of the undead wave. The next level does much the same thing, just swap out the shopping mall of Dawn for the isolated farmhouse of the original Night of the Living Dead. Knob Cheese Farm? Ugh is a long level. One that sees you go from stalking militiamen through rows of corn, to driving a makeshift tractor tank through a section of roadblocked and ambush-laden farmland, to a final massive assault on the heavily defended farmhouse. It starts off slow at first, but the closer you get to the farmhouse and the bigger your horde grows, it quickly ramps up in much the same way the original Night of the Living Dead did. And that's not to say it's easy. The fight is just as tough on your end. The Irregulars do not fuck about. If they catch you alone, you're basically shit out of luck. Your only hope is to let a rip and pray you can tear through them faster than their bullets can tear through you. By the time you actually get inside, there are zombies smashing through the boarded up windows to grab at the militiamen you've backed up against them. The rooms and hallways are swarming with the dead, and there's nothing the Irregulars can really do but wait for the end. It evokes the desperate situation of the film it draws from well, to the point where I think the tonal scales finally shift closer to horror than comedy. The farm is the only level to take place completely outside the context of Punchbowl's retro-futuristic B-movie setting, but by removing the game from that context it ever so slightly breaks the perfect absurdist fantasy established by the earlier levels and plants a toe firmly in reality. The farm, in contrast to everywhere else you've visited in the game, is strikingly mundane. No ramps, no robots, no flying cars. You could even say the Irregulars are mundane too, given there do exist groups who have planned out and prepared for a zombie apocalypse in real life, unlikely as it is to occur. Gold dang idiots! Can't you see he's a tool of the Illuminati? This is all part of their plot to set up a one world government via the Mormon Tabernacle Choir? Penguins interbreeding with leprechauns? Maps of the Flat Earth systematically removed from public schools? Why? Do you need to ask? Who stands to benefit the most from a commie controlled America? The dead, that's who! It all comes together. Ancient Mayans, dead Arrays, dinosaur bones. Even back in 2005, this level evoked chills. There's just something about it that gets under my skin, in a way no other part of the game does. But that's not really a bad thing. My one real gripe is the tractor tank section, which suffers from the same problems all the vehicle heavy areas do. Only more so here, because unlike the hover cars, it can and will get stuck in the terrain if you're not careful. There is one last thing I'd like to say about this level, and it has to do with this barn. Back when I was a kid, I never actually went inside, I just always beelined straight for the farmhouse. So I never actually saw this cutscene where Stubbs channels Patton and inspires his horde to, what else, eat brains. Brains! 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 It's such a little moment, but it was shocking to me that I could have missed it all those years ago. It just goes to show you can always learn more about the games you love. We're not talking about the sheep again. You corner Otis at the heart of the farmhouse, but there's not much of a confrontation. Otis is too stunned to discover he's already killed Stubbs once before to try finishing him off a second time, and our boy uses the moment of quiet to light a post-carnage cigarette. <sighs> With Otis and the Irregulars dealt with, Stubbs rides off into the sunset on the back of a sheep. And just as a side note before we continue, I love the sheep models in this game. Not like that. They look so weird, they're so narrow, it's like they've been squashed in Blender or something. Anyway, Baba Black Sheep takes you to the Punchbowl Dam, and immediately keels over dead because this level chugs mad amounts of piss. As I mentioned before, each of the game's levels is built around some narrative or mechanical theme 
theme, and the themes at the dam are wave defense and piss. The run through the dam itself isn't all that bad. Going up against scientists with ray guns and barbershop quartet singers with jetpacks, man this game got weird quickly, is a return to the campy tone that was largely missing from the rampage through Knob Cheese Farm. There's even a moment of spectacle when you look upon the distant JPEG of Punch Bowl from atop the dam, and though it never looked like much even in 2005, I still find it charming. But beside that, there is piss. So, so much piss. The fight at the top of the dam is, by far, the worst part of the game. It is not fun to play, nor is the idea of a pissing zombie particularly funny after the first five seconds. If it only lasted that long, maybe it would be okay, but it doesn't. It can last up to ten minutes as you're constantly under attack from waves of cops and scientists who will, at most, leave you alone for maybe ten seconds at a time. You can't die by falling in the water, which is a small mercy, but there's so little cover and the enemies are now so strong that you're probably going to be playing through this section multiple times. It is an ordeal, and the area that follows soon after is only slightly better. Instead of defending one point, you are now defending four as you try to overload the dam. The area is larger, but you're given a poorly disguised ghost from the original Halo to act as a troop carrier between the different defense points so you can quickly ferry zombies from place to place. What makes the section frustrating is how hard it is sometimes to actually tell which of the points is under attack, but more so it's the flying barbershop quartet singers. In a game focused on ground level melee combat, I have to question the inclusion of a ranged aerial enemy, especially one as strong and as fast as this. The barbershop quartet singers serve as the game's hardest basic enemies, who take ridiculous amounts of damage to bring down and dish out just as much in the fighting. They are also the only enemy who will jump at you, which was really weird the first time I saw it. This guy just comes flying awkwardly out of the sky to punch me across the face. It's wild. The jetpack variant is so strong and so rare that they're practically reserved as mini bosses, and the one here can make this section a living nightmare if you're low on zombies to spare as lightning rods. Without gut grenades or a hand to throw, you really have no way of fighting them. Jumping to take swings at them when they stop to shoot is your only option at that point, and given how little damage they take from each hit, it makes the fight an exercise in tedium. But eventually the dam breaks and you're swept back to Punch Bowl. As if an outbreak of zombies wasn't enough, the city has now been half destroyed by the sudden flash flood of the dam. Since you left, the army has been called in, and the city streets are now swarming with soldiers as much as they are zombies, with the few remaining civilians trapped in the middle of it all. We are now well into the past of the zombie outbreak where there is nothing for the living to do but retreat, and the presence of the army with their jeeps and tanks helps to bring home the seriousness of the situation. The helpful robots and hovercars are all gone, washed away when the dam burst. Punch Bowl is literally falling down around you, and the tonal shift toward horror persists, but somehow it doesn't break the absurdist vibes like Knob Cheese Farm did. Maybe because you're still fighting absolute buffoons amidst the debris of Punch Punchbowl's retro-futuristic architecture. It's a good escalation of conflict, and sets the mood perfectly for the rest of the game. But the difficulty spike is insane, to the point where it just stops being fun. One thing I found interesting returning to this project is just how quickly I skipped over the second half of the game in the original version of the script. When I think back to the game I loved as a kid, when I remember the levels I played over and over again to indulge in the chaos, the fun always stops around the farm. Recording the game again for this updated version of the video, I was on autopilot from the dam onward. I just wasn't enjoying myself anymore. It doesn't help that the remaster, for some reason, stripped out some of the area's personality by removing the songs in Spanky's Diner. The sex joke menu items just aren't enough to carry it. The gameplay certainly doesn't. You're not fighting Punchbowl's finest anymore, you're fighting the United States Army. And while your victory is inevitable, they don't make it easy. Their rifles and machine guns can cut through you and your horde like a hot knife through butter, and if you're too close to a landmine when one of the dead shuffles across it, you can bet you've bought an express ticket to the moon. <laughs> 
It's a lot harder to build up a sea of zombies when the soldiers do a pretty good job of holding back the tide, even on normal, even with what might as well be an infinite supply of undead reinforcements. You may disagree, you may think the difficulty spike allows for a greater emphasis on strategy and tactics, but that's not what I've ever found fun about playing Stubbs the Zombie. Like I said at the start of the video, it's a comfort game. I'm just here to eat some brains. I'm not looking for an actual challenge. It's why I used to play through it all the time on easy. And even if I did want a challenge, I don't think this was the right way to go about it. Hiding high damage enemies in hard to reach places, or spawning groups behind your back, gets cheap after after the first couple of times it happens, and even the basic army grunts pack enough firepower to take down Stubbs' backup without much effort. You can always possess them, you can walk the bastards into their own landmines if you want, but that doesn't bolster your horde, it just creates more corpses. It doesn't feel like you're surfing the green wave across Punchbowl anymore, it feels like you're scraping along by the skin of your teeth. And maybe that was the intent, maybe you can find that challenge engaging, but for me, it was was just a chore. To say nothing of how brutal some of the checkpoints are, god damn. At least there's a good variety to the soldiers. Like I said before, there's a surprising amount of variety in the human enemies overall. Weapons tend to be locked to each type, so only cops will have sidearms and tasers. Only irregulars will have muskets and shotguns. And only soldiers carry assault rifles and grenades. Each enemy type has their own unique behaviour too. Civilians will cower, soldiers will combat roll, and as already mentioned, barbershop singers will jump like hyper-aggressive frogs to get at you. It's a good roster, and like everything else in the game, goes a long way in keeping the combat from getting stale. They move slowly though, slow enough that even Stubbs at walking speed is generally able to catch up, and this extends to when you possess them with the hand too. I can't decide whether this is a bit crap, or if it makes sense to incentivize focusing on melee combat and building up huge hordes of zombies, since since that is the backbone of the gameplay loop. If I have one criticism of the human enemies, it's that their AI is, uh, <laughs> simplistic. Tactical geniuses they are not, and most will just stand around waiting to be munched. Some of them won't even react to your presence at all. They do get a little more dangerous as the game goes on, but that's due to them having higher health and stronger weapons than it is them getting smarter. It is a far cry from the AI on display in Stubbs' fellow controversially cannibalistic game fear, but it works for what the game is. This weird inverted tower defense section doesn't. I gave it a pass in the original version of the video, but after playing the game again, nah, fuck this. It does add some variety to the gameplay, and it is kind of novel to be on the other side of a siege set piece, but the heightened difficulty makes it hard to keep a large horde up against the barricade, and you as Stubbs will usually be too busy fighting for your damn life to help in the attack. It's a good idea executed poorly, though thankfully you can cheese your way through the much larger second siege by possessing a guy with a rocket launcher up on the high ground. At least the next level is a return to form. The assault on Dr. Y's laboratory is the last hurrah for Punchbowl's aesthetic of retrofuturism. It's a labyrinth of neon lights, massive computers and jump pads filled with ray gun toting scientists and malfunctioning robots that can and will attack any anything in sight, living or dead. I haven't really spoken about the robots in the game so far. They're at their most numerous here, and while they were present across the early levels of the game, it's only in Dr. Y's lab that they're framed as outright enemies. You could of course go around drawing their aggro or blowing them up, but there was never really much point. Given there is so much variation in the types of humans faced throughout the campaign, I don't really mind the fact robots are wasted as a possible enemy, but it does feel odd that they are. I would have loved to face down a shield wall of milk bots, or been outcrassed by a gang of pump bots, but instead they just roll around in the background, aware that something's wrong, but either unwilling or unable to do much about it. It fits Punchbowl to a T, flash and futuristic on the outside, but ultimately nothing more than a vapid facade easily pushed over with the least amount of force. The same is true of your fight through the lab. The narrow hallways get repetitive pretty quickly but the big fights that take place in between are among the game's best. There's so much chaos and so much carnage. These big 
arena fights were the most enjoyable part of the game's second half for me, even if they could get pretty cramped at times. It all culminates in a confrontation with Dr. Y, and sadly it continues the game's trend of bad boss fights. It starts off well, with the revelation that Stubbs' return from the dead was caused by, of all things, a kind of super aggressive fertilizer, but the fight itself is just tedious. Dr. Y's reflective ray gun can actually drain your health fairly quickly, but he uses it so erratically, and there are enough places to hide, that it's never really a problem. And even if it is, civilians continuously spawn in, so you'll never run out of health or abilities. It's not a particularly challenging fight. What makes it frustrating is that Dr. Y is another aerial enemy, one with a force field. Turning it off isn't actually that difficult. All you have to do is hit these four buttons in the centre of the room. It's actually hitting him when he's vulnerable that's the hard part. He spends so much of his vulnerable state just flying to his recharge station that it's hard to actually deal out much damage before his shield comes back and he returns to the skies. The fight does go by a lot faster if you just spam him with gut grenades, but it's easy to miss him, and even easier to run out long before he's dead, at which point you have to start running around in search of civilians to munch to recharge your abilities. There's very little challenge here, just a lot of frustration and not much fun. It does however lead to a line that has stuck with me for the past 19 years. I hope you like the taste of formaldehyde. Because you're going to be swimming in it! Hey, what's a pup bot gotta do to get a little action around here? After dealing with Dr. Y comes one last romp through the streets of Punchbowl. This is the penultimate level, and the tone is appropriately climactic and grim. It is a far cry from the bright and sunny scenes of the game's opening moments, which is made all the more apparent when you actually return to the spot where Stubbs first emerged. There's nothing on the ground to mark exactly where he came from, just like there's nothing in the sky to indicate there are actual planes dropping these airstrikes, but the impact of his presence presence can be seen everywhere you look, from the ruined buildings, to the army camps, to the mines laid out in patterns across the streets. You even get to go back through the plaza by City Hall as you did in the tutorial. It's such a perfect level narratively and thematically, but mechanically it stumbles hard, because this is another vehicle-centric section. True, the vehicle in question is a Pershing tank, and it is fun to go around blowing your enemies to pieces, especially when some, like the barbershop singers, are so tanky themselves. But this was never a game about shooting people, this was a game about eating brains. And it's disappointing that you weren't given one last victory lap down the street where it all began with a massive horde at your back to show how far you've come. As it is, you're likely to end the level completely alone, the last zombie left in a city devoid of the living or the dead. The difficulty is now so high that it's actually easier to jump behind the wheels of a tank and start blasting, because there's no way you'll ever make it to the end of the level on foot. At least the song the barbershop quartet singers serenade you with as you reach the plaza is really good. Thus begins the final level, City Hall, and it is, unfortunately, a low note to end on. The fight up through the building is the most difficult in the game since, much like Obi-Wan Kenobi, the barbershop quartet singers all have the high ground. It culminates in a fight with Sonny Skegness, the leader of the barbershop quartet security detail who the game has very vaguely tried to frame as a rival for Stubbs in Maggie's affections. Get your own woman! This one's I've got it all worked out, dead man. Once I kill you, Maggie's heart will be mine. Oh, broads love it when you kill for them. Let's end this. Mono a mono, just you and me. 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 But the fight is about as low effort as the setup. Aside from his character model, he is no different from any of the other barbershop quartet singers you've been fighting, right down to having the same voice lines. I can't decide whether I like how the guy is treated as just another enemy, like he's not even worth Stubbs' attention as a proper boss fight, or if it's a missed opportunity to do something more and bring the plot arc to a close. At least it's over quickly. Would you be a dear and tell Mr. Monday he's got five minutes before the whole town goes up in smoke. Thank you so much.
The same cannot be said for the game's final boss, Andrew Monday. But before we get into that fresh cancer, I'd like to talk about the game's story. The game hits you with a lot of twists in quick succession, and they actually work pretty well. Oh my... Those eyes... That nose... That tie... Mother, get back! That thing has destroyed my whole city, and I won't let him do the same to you. Don't do this, Andrew! Get out of the way, Mother! I love that zombie! Excuse me? Stubbs and Andrew are in fact father and son. Stubbs hasn't been chasing Maggie across Punchbowl because he's a monster. The two were lovers back when he was alive. In fact, that's why Otis killed him in the 1930s. Stubbs, despite appearances, actually had deep connections to Punchbowl all along. I really like this reveal, much more than the explanation that Fertilizer was the thing that brought Stubbs back. Not just because the dichotomy of Stubbs's failure and Andrew's success as businessman is hilarious, but because it gives the final fight much more personal stakes, without sacrificing the tone carefully built up across the game. It's a twist that has quite a lot of show don't tell foreshadowing too, which makes catching the little hints on a second playthrough more engaging than you might expect in a game with such a simple story. my city. You killed my family. And now I suppose you want to kill me. Well, go ahead. Go ahead and try, Dad. The fight with Andrew, however, is pretty bad. The original Halo didn't have boss fights for a reason. The engine is not well suited to it. The fight here is another tower attack section, but it is by far the worst. Andrew sits behind not one, but two layers of rotating force fields that you can only really damage with gut grenades, since even the barbershop ray guns don't seem to do much more than tickle them. There are civilians constantly spawning in for you to use as health and ability recharges, but so too is there a constant and steady stream of barbershop quartet soldiers, some of whom carry rocket launchers that can one hit kill you. And the chaos of the fight being what it is, you can sometimes get hit by one of these rockets before you even know the enemy has spawned in. It's a real mess of a finale, made worse by the fact you don't even get to kill Andrew Monday at the end of it. Instead, Maggie and Stubbs shamble off together as the army flies in an airstrike to settle the zombie problem for good. Andrew Monday and his evil twin watch on from the steps of City Hall as Punchbowl isn't actually destroyed by the airstrike at all, Stubbs and Maggie share a kiss, the fade out freaks out, and thus our tale comes to an end. Roll credits. As much as I enjoy Stubbs' story, it does have some pacing issues. I get the sense a lot of stuff got cut late into development that left everything in the final version a little wonky. For example, Dr. Y's lab is filled with the same screens that covered the walls of the police station which makes me think he was originally meant to taunt you across the level the same way Chief Masters did. Indeed, it feels like a whole level got cut after the Punchbowl Dome. You see this area in the cutscene between the greenhouse and the cop shop, but never actually get to play through it. And the way Stubbs just ends up shuffling his way into the police station has always felt awkward. The way the game cranks up the difficulty in its second half and races along to its conclusion feels like the result of lacking the time to properly balance and polish certain areas too. Sacrifices clearly had to be made in order to get the game finished at all. And as I've already mentioned, there are running gags that feel cut conspicuously short, like Judy's rotating roster of identical boyfriends, or Pumpbot's sudden reappearance during the fight with Dr. Y, or Sonny's non-rivalry with Stubbs. Speaking of Sonny, what about that moment in the greenhouse where he turns around to attack you in a cutscene, and then just vanishes until the very end of the 
game, there's an expanded version of Stubbs the Zombie with at least one extra level and a bunch more story content that never got to see the light of day. And that's a shame, because what the developers were able to finish is pretty incredible for the mid-2000s. Sure, the jokes don't always land, but the satire of 1950s America is razor sharp, and the attention to detail in the moment-to-moment -moment plot is pretty great. I like how there's a realistic delay between the introduction of every antagonist and their later arrival as an opposing force in gameplay. Stubbs takes Otis and Chief Masters and Dr. Y by surprise. They all need time to recover from the shock and organise their allies to send out a counterattack. I think it's clever how Stubbs carves through each of the antagonists in the order of how responsible they are for his resurrection too. He and Chief Masters are total strangers. Otis is the one who put him in the ground the first time around, Dr. Y is the one who accidentally brought him back, and finally Maggie and Andrew were technically the ones to blame for everything that happens in the game. I wish the devs had been able to realise whatever they had planned in full. Aside from the scars left behind by whatever wide load had to rip out of the game to get it released on time, there are still a handful of bugs left in the remaster worth mentioning. The sound issues I've already talked about, the glitches carried over from the original version I sort of understand, but I really don't get why they ripped out so much of the music when it's already so rare to begin with. There are odd glitches in cutscenes like how Andrew Monday's aforementioned evil twin pops into existence during the ending, or this moment where Chief Masters was apparently getting attacked by a zombie behind the screen of this legally distinct Vault Co. Pip-Boy, something that rarely appears anyway, which only adds to my suspicion that the final few months of development were rushed. Everything else was either pretty minor or pretty funny, like this scientist who fell forever in Dr. Y's lab. The main issue is the crashes, which for a remaster I think are pretty inexcusable. For all its flaws, and there are a few, there's nothing really out there quite like Stubbs the Zombie in the gaming sphere. Even more recently released games sold on the premise of playing as a monster like Carrion or Maneater don't quite scratch the same itch in the same way, since in those games you play as a singular agent of destruction. The closest I can think of to a sister title would be Destroy All Humans, also released in 2005, a game where you play as an alien harvesting brains in a tongue-in-cheek parody of 1950s B-movies. Destroy All Humans got a remake in 2020, and I suspect that was partly the reason behind the re-release of Stubbs the Zombie in 2021. But I also think it's because gaming itself is going through a zombie renaissance. There was once a time where you couldn't swing a cat without taking off a zombified head in the process, and in the late 2000s and early 2010s, there were so many games centred around fighting zombies, and for the most part, only zombies, that the market entered a kind of fatigue which saw them largely disappear for a while. But it's a fatigue that seems to be on the wane, if the success of games like the remakes of Resident Evil 2 and 3 are any indication. Stubbs always stood apart from the gaming zombie craze anyway in my opinion. The game released just a little bit too early to be considered part of the big wave that oversaturated the market, but more than that, it stands apart from most zombie-centric titles because it does something no other undead-centric title I've seen has depict the zombie condition with humanity. A zombie is a monster, but it's a monster that is also fundamentally human. The modern idea of the concept has its origins in colonial Haiti, where it was a myth born of the very real fear held by African slaves that not even death would free them from their bondage, that they would be forced to work the fields forever. Seen from that angle, the zombie condition is enormously sympathetic and enormously tragic, but it's an angle rarely considered these days especially in video games, where there's only really one thing zombies have ever represented, and that's something to shoot. Stubbs is a rare exception to that rule. He's more than just a corpse, he's an actual character, and it's for that reason he stands out as unique in gaming, if not zombie media as a whole. Back when the game first launched in 2005, there were talks of a potential sequel to Rebel Without a Pulse, but any hope of that eventually happening seems to have died with wide load when they closed their doors in 2014 after being bought by Disney, of all companies. The remastered jokes about a 
mustering up enough demand for a sequel, but four years on in 2024, I don't really see it happening. It's a shame, because the simplicity of the game offered a lot of potential for a sequel in terms of mechanical expansion and technical improvement, but at the same time, I can't actually imagine what that might look like. Updated graphics, sure, but how do you improve or expand upon the basic gameplay loop? The whole thing was already starting to get stale by the end of the first game, at least it was for me, and I can't imagine how any sequel could top the setting or the story of Punchbowl and the satire inherent within. The game's sense of humour is another big reason I don't think there will ever be a sequel. That style of comedy just isn't in vogue anymore, and Stubbs the Zombie wouldn't be Stubbs the Zombie without it. It's a time capsule of the mid-2000s, from its mechanics to its wit, and I wouldn't have it any other way, but it's not something easily resurrected today in the mid-2020s. Stubbs the Zombie Rebel Without a Pulse is not perfect, but it is certainly memorable, and an experience I think is still worth having, and thanks to the 2021 remaster, it's never been easier to do so. It won't blow your mind, the graphics aren't the best, the story's a little scuffed, and the mechanics definitely show off their rot in the second half, but no other game can give you the experience of playing as the bad guy quite like Stubbs the Zombie. It's why I keep coming back to it after all these years. Sometimes you don't need high art to get you through the day. Sometimes all you want to do is just sit down, turn your brain off for a few hours, and eat some folks. Thanks for watching. Incredible! You dance like an undead centuries! And that's the video. Before I go, I'd like to thank by name the people supporting the channel with $5 US a month or more on Patreon. Azazel, Hawkwing2652, Haymatey, Robelly, Sarah Bloomer, Sneezy McGlassface, and This Sour Kraut. Thank you so much. To everyone else, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time. Okay, you can do this. You can listen to your old work without cringing. Hey everybody. Today we're playing Stubbs the Zombie, Rebel Without a Pulse. Jesus fucking Christ.